So there is a ton happening overseas and we need to figure out how what's happening over there affects us over here in the States. We called in to our London Bureau Chief, Martin Backerdax. He hopped on the phone. Martin, thank you so much for doing this so quickly with us. Oh, you're welcome, Tracy. I'm enjoying it. It's been a fascinating day here in Europe, no question. For sure. Okay, so we start with the elections, I guess. Where are we with the Italian elections? It's a great question. I think lots of people in Italy would like to know the answer as well. <laughs> it was an extraordinary Sunday, but really what ended up when all the votes were cast was precisely what the analysts had anticipated, and that was a dead heat with respect to the major parties, hung parliament uh, in the vernacular of parliamentary politics here in Europe. In other words, no one has emerged with a majority that they could command in parliament and therefore have a government that would be stable enough to lead for the coming years. So what that's going to mean in practice is that once the votes are counted and Parliament convenes on the 21st of March, the parties are going to have to horse trade with one another in order to try to come up with a coalition government that works and that passes the president's muster, or they're going to have to go back to the electorate probably in the fall and ask for another mandate. I think we're probably looking at a second election unless something extraordinary happens in the next few days. But that's where we are in Italian politics at the moment, deadlocked, as we have been on a number of occasions really since the second world war you know it's really interesting like you you almost feel like you're looking in a mirror actually because there is some comparison to here in the united states isn't there i believe so i i really do i mean what we saw the most for me the most incredible dynamic over the weekend was the way in which italian voters just drove away from the mainstream parties in fact what you're looking at is the movement five-star party which actually gained probably the most votes Uh, over the course of Sunday. That's a party that didn't exist five years ago and was founded by a television comedian. It's absolutely extraordinary. Now it's going to be led by a... It'd be like It could be led by a 31-year-old man who never had a job, who's never been elected, and really doesn't have any political experience whatsoever. The Italians are ready to pin their hopes on someone like that rather than the establishment. But I kind of feel like that's how it is here in the States, right? Like, I mean, if Jimmy Kimmel or one of those guys came out and said, I'm starting a third party, I think that like a good chunk of the country would rally around them. So that says something, doesn't it, about what people want these days and, and, and giving it to them. That's precisely it. I think what people want, what can be afforded, and how it can be delivered are three things at the moment that simply aren't joined up. And that really was what was expressed over the weekend. Italy is in a very significantly difficult situation. It's one of the most indebted countries in the world. The Italian bond market is the third largest. Italy has a debt to GDP ratio of 132%. And we must remember, Italy can't print money in order to pay down this debt. It has to earn it through economic growth. Of course, Italy hasn't really grown at all over the past 10 years, and it's suffered through three recessions. Now, its GDP is starting to advance at the moment. It's being advanced alongside the broader European economy, and it's actually doing well. But youth unemployment in Italy sits at 31.5%, which is an absolutely staggering figure. You're looking at one in three young Italians out of work, and most of them are having to leave the country in order to find jobs. So you have economic instability, you have young people who simply aren't at work, and you have political sclerosis that, of course, has created the, the disparity between those at the elite level and those who are not. And all of that coagulated together to put you know, what you saw over the weekend, which was five-star movement gaining significantly, some other anti-establishment parties in the north of Italy gaining enormously, particularly on the far right, and the anti-establishment parties in the south also gaining ground. So you have a <laughs> fractured state at the moment, and this is the third largest economy in Italy, so right. it really well, does have look, some incredible right, implications. You can't help but flash back to what happened with Greece, right? Do we worry about now, like, in, they, I saw it written as an Italy, like, do we worry that Italy is going to threaten to leave, and do we even care? That would seem extraordinary to me. Both of the populist parties that have done well over the weekend have said in the past that they would like to have a referendum on membership of not only the single currency, but the broader European Union. I think a lot of analysts have dismissed that as simply ways in which to gain electoral votes. And it actually was a successful strategy because people in Italy are fed up with the broader political process. Now, if you're asking most people, including myself, their ire should be more directed to Rome than it is to Brussels, but nonetheless, that's where the anger is directed. So you could conceivably see a repeat of the Greece situation, but I do think that that would be in the extremis. I think you're more likely to see the continued ongoing fractured Italian politics. But I think your point, Tracy, is a very good one in the sense that what does it tell us about the ways in which populist parties in other parts of the world are gaining ground? 
also in the United States, where you have a president with no political experience who rode in on a wave of populism, right. challenging the consensus and promising the American voters all sorts of things, some of which he has delivered and some of which he has not. So let's talk about that. I mean, and now give the people what they want. And the president riding in, he rode in the other day with this tariff threat. I mean, talking about putting tariffs on steel and aluminum, where, how, play that out for us. I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? And Tracy, I believe that that is really the populist manifestation of politics in America that we are seeing here in Europe, where a president who is uniquely in tune with the voice of the country, that can't be denied. Say what you want about the president. He reads the mood of the electorate better than anybody I've seen in years and years of politics. And he taps into that very specifically through his communication on Twitter. And that's exactly where he goes when he wants to advance serious yep. policy tariffs being one of them, and of course, tit for tat trade wars with Europe and China and other allies uh, being another. So I think over the weekend when he talked about the potential for not only tariffs on steel and aluminum imports, but also on European car manufacturers, he is speaking to parts of the economy that have suffered significantly through globalization over the past 20 years. And he's speaking directly to voters in key states who feel that they have lost jobs as a result of unfair trade agreements that were signed by previous administrations. Because, now, because but that's his I don't know that he's correct about that, no, but nonetheless, right, he's but, playing into that concern. But that's been his stance on this, right? Like, you know, we put these tariffs, we keep jobs. It's about, to him, it's right about keeping American jobs. So to play, you know, the devil's advocate here, these tariffs arguably could help these struggling industries in the United States, these unemployed workers, defunct towns, like towns that have gone basically black because industry has gone overseas. And that's what he's saying. It this is exactly what he's saying. And, and you can understand why people would buy into this because that sort of, even if it's a 5% success rate, it's a 5% better chance than many of these people in these forgotten cities have had in the past. Uh, Tracy, I can remember, I lived in Washington DC about a decade ago and I drove to visit some relatives in Canada. I drove through the state of Pennsylvania and I was staggered to see the number of industrial towns that were just laid to waste yeah. uh, as a result of the change in industry and the change of the American economy from a manufacturing one to a services one. And of course, many of those jobs have, have relocated to Mexico, to other parts of, of South America, and indeed to Asia and the rest of the world. But it really was visceral uh, in the sense that you experienced the, the, the pain of some of these cities. And you can understand if they have a dynamic politician who's standing in front of them and saying, I can bring these jobs back. They're willing to roll the dice and believe him rather than to listen to the lectures of people like me and others who say those <laughs> jobs aren't coming back. <laughs> <laughs> well, and look, and uh, as with most things that come out of the president's mouth, it's all yet to be determined whether it goes anywhere. But let's now talk about how to trade this. I mean, who wins, who loses in this tariff war? Well, I think, uh, you know, our man Jim Cramer, as ever, said it best. He is someone whose opinion I respect immensely. He went through an enormous amount of stocks over the weekend. And he just said, listen, I cannot find that many that are going to be specifically threatened by tit for tat trade tariffs that are put forth by other countries, Europe in particular, but also potentially Canada, uh, China, and elsewhere. And I'm willing to believe him on that. And I think he's absolutely right. But what I do think is going to happen is that if we are looking at a global stock market that has been rising on the basis of low interest rates and synchronized global growth, we know that at least one of those dynamics is starting to change. And that, of course, is low interest rates because we're hearing hawkish news from the Fed, from the European Central Bank, from the Bank of England and elsewhere. If synchronized global growth is going to be threatened as a result of trade wars, then two dimensions of the bullish stock market story are starting to drift away. Your, uh, strong earnings are still going to be there for a number of quarters now, but they won't last forever because the comparable basis will begin to come forth in a year's time. Yeah. So we can see two of the potential bullish stories start to fade away this year and the third next year. So if these aren't arrested, we could see from an index basis, equities underperform and fixed income outperform. I think that's probably a longer term perspective and one that would ha affect passive strategies more than active ones. But I think Jim is absolutely right. If you can actively select stocks inside of that, you can do well. But I think most of us are probably invested in a passive sense and we're going to have to be a little bit careful about anticipating the similar gains of 2017 into this year. 
Yeah, as with all things, everyone has to stay on their toes, which is exactly why people should stay in touch with thestreet.com. Follow Martin. You know, you, you, have, you have two great pieces out today, one on the German auto unions and one on how the markets reacted after the elections. So everybody needs to check out Martin's stuff. Martin, we got to do this again because what happens over there totally affects us over here, and nobody has better insight on all this than you do. So thank you again. I guess you're done for the day, huh? I certainly am. It's been about a 12 hour one, but this is labor of love. As I say, I don't do it for the money, Tracy, and neither do you. And thank God, because we're not going to get paid now. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we're journalists. Martin, you're great. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> thank you, Tracy.